This is Conversation Balloons, a podcast of interviews with experts and friends about all things generational. I'm your host, Leah Farish. We rarely have guests who are overseas, but today we will visit North Africa. Throughout that region, where I have spent a great deal of time, persecution of religious minorities, mainly Christians, is taking place. Worldwide, government sources estimate that one in seven Christians is being persecuted. With everything from severe job and academic discrimination to rape, starvation, even crucifixion. Our particular interest today is how persecution and discrimination affect the parenting process. First, we'll interview an Arab Christian couple in the region about how they are raising their kids in a hostile atmosphere. Be aware that we had to bleep out some names and places and change some details to protect that family. Then we will speak with Shelley Alanese with Ananias House and her project called Through the Eyes of a Child. In a future episode, I plan to talk with two other families in very different settings about parenting and persecution. Let's go. It's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Rebecca and her husband, Elia. 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 Yeah. Elia. <laughs> Elia sounds like my name, Leah. So I didn't know. Um, yeah. Elia. Yes. Elia. Yeah. Elia. And um I am so honored to talk with you. You are in North Africa. And thank you for taking the time to talk with me today about parenting your children in a society that discriminates against your religion and um where you are limited in your activities as a Christian. Um, you have two children, and um, they're both, we won't say their exact ages, but they're older children. Well, yeah. And uh, still in, in school. And um, I just got to talk with one of them a minute ago. And I have been in your home, and uh, I am just so honored to know you as a family, and you're doing a great job with raising these kids. I want to ask what um, it has been like for them at school. How are they treated? Are they treated differently by, first of all, their teachers than um kids in the Muslim majority classroom? Yeah, for uh, first of all, we want to thank you, Leah, for this opportunity uh, to talk to you and to share about uh, our raising children in our context, which means a Muslim context, Uh, especially in in the school. Yeah, our children like uh, having an experience from the time when they start going to to kindergarten and uh, it was like the first step for them like to to experience a different environment from their homes because we raised them as a uh, because we uh, a christian family we uh, we used to teach them the word of God, and also to raise them in the, like in a in a Christian spirit, but the first time, like in a in an age, uh, like three uh, three years and a half, they started going to kindergarten because we were busy in the ministry. We were afraid because in kindergarten they. Uh, uh, they should. Uh, they have a special program uh, from the government, like starting from eight o'clock morning. They start eight o'clock, and they, until twelve o'clock they have a break time for two hours, and after they continue to four p.m. And from eight o'clock they have two hours, like for memorizing the the Quran. But we used to bring them after uh, 
you mean after the, the, the first two hours after they finish memorizations uh, for the Quran in, uh, in the, curtain, the kindergarten? Because we don't have any other choice. Because for mm. all kindergarten, the, the children, they must take the Quran, you mean, and they should memorize it. But we thank God, since like wisely, we, we will offer it the first time. But the experience we have with uh, with them is like after one year in for going in the in the kindergarten. Even we try to help them. This uh, they told us that the teachers he told us the teachers he told us. You mean they start in trusting in the teachers, not trusting in the in the in the parents at home. It was like a big uh, problems for us. How? We will offer it that the teacher win and taking our children for, from us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's, we thank God. It's like taking a few months and also we start a few months and uh, the children like, uh, like uh, how we say, like winning them again to trust our teaching because. Uh, Maybe the children, they think that their parents, they're not able, like a psychological problem. They think that the parent they're not able to teach them. This is why they bring him to the kindergarten. This is how they, uh-huh. but, yeah, they trust everything the teachers say, that they don't trust us. They say, no, the teachers told us that, yeah, it was a little bit hard, yeah. Now, now that they're older, they do have to be in school all day, though, right? That's the requirement. Oh yes, uh, and they are tested on that, and they're graded. Oh yes, and yeah. yes, if they get like a fail mark, it can also affect their their marks. Yeah, in the examination, yeah, as they they memorize, but it's it's like memorizing geography and other subject. Yeah, okay. And um, do they have other? Uh, does the uh, Islamic curriculum do, does that? The, does the Islamic faith penetrate through all the subjects? Oh yes, there is is like uh, how we say is is like uh, a, a school climate is like uh, uh, Islamic education climate. Even sometimes Arabic is he has a links Arabic subjects he has a links with education Islam, and also history, and uh, and the French and French, and also some other subjects only mathematics and science and also it depends the teachers if the teachers they like having a cover and some radical Muslims. And even the subject, they go out from the subjects and they teach their themselves all the time. Especially when there is like, uh, like for fasting, uh, fasting month for Muslims. Mm-hmm. There's not all most of the teachers they talk about going to the mosque. They talk about uh, uh, Muslim traditions and they t- talking about fasting and encourage children to fast and. And also trying to ask the children to, to uh, like and uh, the the boy and the girls like wearing clothes like a long clothes not a sh- not, not mm-hmm. taking like a, a shirt clothes and mm-hmm. also asking the lady to uh, the the girls to cover their heads when we have like a gathering for worship we need to like to close the windows and to be careful from the people. And also to hide, not talking loudly about mm-hmm. our faith. And also sometimes some teachers, they may talk badly about Christian faith, that Christianity is modify and Jesus is not uh, the Son of God, is not God, is only a prophet. It's something which is uh, touch their heart. They're not happy, but it's for them it's, it's like uh, hearing and not hearing. It's like uh, we thank God, says God's grace is helping them how to hear and not this, uh, how I say, not uh, the people's speech or talking has an impact, a negative impact in their face. They don't care even when they hear some things against their face. It's like 
It's like I can say this: we see God's grace in their lives. Yeah, good. And also all the time we ask him, please don't argue with the teacher. We, we just ask him, please don't raise any question. It's you will be in trouble. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. This is like freedom of speech. Like we talk, I talked with them yesterday, say, we don't have freedom of speech. We have a lot of things to share and to say, and to say, and, uh, and we cannot. Yes. Um. Rebecca, what have you seen in terms of things that go on in the classroom? What have what have you heard? Have the have the kids been mistreated by teachers? Of that, are there things that teachers have said that were yes, you know, one insulting? Uh, yeah, one one day uh, when uh, our uh, elders were, was in a. Uh, in, uh, in the primary school, yeah, uh, he left the school and he was very afraid. And he asked me, Mom, does my teacher know that I am a Christian? I replied, no, uh, how could she know? And, uh, and I asked him, why you ask this question? He answered me, today the teacher asked uh, us a question about, uh, about Islam. And I didn't. I did not know how to answer. And she said to me, "Are you not a Muslim?" Oh. And yeah. And uh, you must know this answer. He he was so afraid and say, "Why? Maybe she know that I am a Christian. Why she she said this?" And say, "Okay, don't be afraid. Just uh, maybe is a coincidence. She said this." And. Uh, after this situation, uh, that situation, and we start to teach them, you know, to teach them like uh, and help them how to memorize and uh, uh, know the Islamic lesson because they need to uh, they need to achieve a good point in their exam and also uh, yeah they will yeah use use this when they grow up. To explain to Muslim that uh, what uh, they believe uh, is uh, incorrect, and uh, now how to answer other people also. Okay. And yeah. From that time, he start like uh, memorizing and uh, have a good mark in in his uh, Islamic. <laughs> and this year, uh, when I went with him uh, to have uh, the the final results, the teacher uh, told me. Uh, this the this is my son. Uh, uh, he is like a a, a religious man. Oh, like yeah. I say <laughs> why? And she she said yeah. He answered very well, and he respect uh, all uh, teachers, and he respect uh, the school law and everything. He is so quiet. And oh, thanks, okay. God, yeah, because uh, yeah, he can yeah he understand. What happened before and use it for his uh, uh -huh. his time now. So, um, do do people know that your kids are Christians at school? Is some not all the people, no. just few. Yeah, a few do. Okay. Yeah. Well, now now let's talk about how the the students and and other kids treat your kids. Do they have uh, friendships with? Um, kids who are not Christians? Uh, only a few, not too much. Uh, it is only in school. It's like uh, after having uh, finishing school, just they came home. I mean, uh, in school, they don't have like a free activity for children, just only after they finish class and all the children, they leave and they go home. Okay, look, it's not just a Christian kid that does that. They all do that. Yeah, yeah. and mostly it's like for the way, it's like we want them not to have, like to have not a deep relation with them because they have a relation with some uh, with believer. A believer. And time to time they connect with, the, with the, some of their friends in school, yeah. Because before when... Uh, yeah, this is uh, this happening is like uh, when 
but he, he, he was in, in primary school. One is a close neighbor, uh, uh, a child. He used to go uh, with to school, but he start asking. In Friday, he came to knock in our door. He asked. Let's go together to the mosque. This is Friday. We're oh. asking, yes, please, don't go with them. And so when, um, and during Ramadan, your your kids just go ahead and, and fast, or they don't eat in front of yeah, their classmates. They had just yeah. breakfast at home, yeah, and yeah. They, they stay like the fasting until they come back. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they took breakfast in the morning time, like uh, 18 and F, 18 and F, or yeah, until 3, 3 30, and 3 30, they come back from school, from school, yeah. Okay. And they, take, and they took their, their lunch yeah, at home. Up to uh, 14, the children, even the teacher, they asked the children, now you have an age, they saw they should fast. Some children might, even in their homes, might not fast in, but when they came to school, they they need to show themselves like they are, they are fasting, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you think your kids, if, it, if the teachers or the students knew that they were Christians, or if they said openly in the classroom that, you know, I don't believe this, uh, or I, I'm a Christian, what would happen? Yeah, for sure, it will be a big trouble. We have experience from our. Uh, there is a Christian is is a leader is close to our place is is in our area. His child one time he bring uh, a Christian book to school. This book is about he was talking about some mistaken in the Quran. And with the teacher discover he saw uh, he saw the book, and they call his father, and they call all the uh, like the administrations. And after the, the the child, he the father he decided to change the school. He's like, okay. and also having same problem in another school. He changed school two times. He has a big trouble. He has to drive his child now from home until school going, yeah. Mm-hmm. And also the child, he uh, is like, is like a fear, fearing to meet people and to meet children and the teachers and they see them like the enemy. The teacher, they don't feel happy uh, when they see this is a, this, uh, this is a, uh, the person, that the boy is a Christian. They try many ways to convince the boys, not giving him more interest in class, and also may give him like a low mark. They given him to sit in the back of classroom. It mm. was. It told me uh, really. It's, it's very painful, and also it's it's hard for for uh, for the girls to to grow and to face this kind of situation. Yeah, you, and you have no alternative i mean like another family changed schools but you're only going to a different uh, school that is heavily muslim and teaches islam and it's it's not just a few minutes it's hours hours every week oh yeah yes yeah yeah okay let me talk with you about um getting getting a spouse someday presumably <laughs> yeah. Your children would would like to get married, or at least you would like to see them get married. How do you think your kids will find a husband or wife? Yeah, we thank God now. We call church is growing. Thank God. Yeah, there is. Uh, it's like before in in our case, it was it was difficult. Uh, it's like. Uh, now in the country there is uh, churches. You mean small groups in different places? Thank God, many people came to the Lord, and also the like. We can talk now in the third generation, and also having Bible camp uh, sometime and meeting other people, and we knew each other, the family, and we move and 
I think it would be more easy for them. Is no, yeah, it's like for meeting other Christians, like girls, yeah, for marriage, yeah, yeah. I think it will be more, yeah, more. Do you, um, so, so the churches in your country, they, they're not open. They have to meet in homes and things like that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. But they can, they can, what you're saying is the churches from various cities or neighborhoods can, can gather every once in a while and meet and kids could meet each other and do things together there. They use, they use the media to communicate. Have your kids had to be somewhat uh, cut off from some of your own extended family because of the difference in religion? Oh, yeah, yes, because like now, because they know our family, they know about our faith. And also for the children, they see them, it's like... <laughs> Different. The difference. We thank God they see them differences. They are good. We thank God for their uh, behavior and also. But just, uh, it's like uh, now my brother's children, uh, he didn't, long time, he didn't uh, visit our home. We can say it's like more than 15 years. And also we have experience with other families. We sometimes visit them, it's just like, Lies like looking down to us and for children. Even they they love them, but they like feeling sorry for them. May think because oh. they they are not they are like taking a how we say role. They're going in a wrong way. It's um, we thank God. We just pray for them and we love them. Yeah. Even sometimes we don't feel like a warm wall. Oh, Welcome from them, but just we visit them and pray for them. Yeah. Okay. Um, Rabika, do you yes. have any other comments on thinking about finding a mate, romance, um, <laughs> starting families? Do you um, do you wish that they could have more chances to be around? other kids of their faith? Yeah, yes, I think they, they have a big opportunity by media, yeah. We okay. we don't have the, this uh, uh, this opportunity. We uh, we wait until we meet together face-to-face. -face. Uh, but for them, yeah, they use media and uh, they speak so many languages and I think they have more opportunity to to find uh, their way and what they they want. Uh -huh. We try to what? help them. Yeah, teach them. Yeah, it's our responsibility to teach uh, to teach them about Christ and uh, uh, what he uh, he is done. And I think they are going to be asked to give uh, an account for their lives. How how do you talk about their future with them? Um, college and finding a good job. Do you see them staying in your country? Do you feel like they would need to leave in order to be free and to practice their faith? Or what's their future like? Do we talking to them about how and where they want to, 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 to study, uh, where they want to live, and that they have an idea, an idea to live because they want they say we want to, to live in freedom and to have the freedom of speech. And uh, it's like like feeling a big pressures and also they see a lot of trouble sometimes. Like before they experience and also when we had the trouble last time. Because like four, uh, four months ago, the police, they came and they knock in our door and they ask about about my ministry, because I meet some people and talk. We have a meeting in, in because of that. And they come and the, uh, he was watching in the windows and they see me and the people, because the police, they came and they asked me to go with them and to talk with me. And they, they, they were not happy because they thinking like taking me somewhere to, 
yeah, it was very, very hard time for them as the children to look from the windows and to see me. Yeah, it, it was very hard. Yeah. Yeah. And also they don't have freedom when they go out and you see the uh, the context is not easy. Like in Ramadan, in in the for Muslim, the big fest of slaughtering, the, the ship you see everywhere is like... Uh, is a terrible thing is going on, and as a children, they have a feeling, they have an emotions, and to see all the things. Like in our case, when it came like for meeting, for worship, and for gathering, we need to hide ourselves. Mm-hmm. That's when, the, <laughs> and for Muslim, you see everything. You see people everywhere, like gathering and doing their uh, how is saying doing their religious things, and for us. When you want to worship and to gather, you need to hide yourself. Yeah, yeah. it's just, yeah for children also they they too much have the feelings and it's like not having uh, trust in their future to stay here, but they think in, yeah, to continue their study abroad and also to have uh, to have freedom. Well, is there anything else that you would like to say? Do you have any message for parents? are in societies where they're raising kids in freedom. Yeah, yes, this is a way I want to share about uh, about full children because sometimes we need to be very careful about uh, how to raise like for a Christian children because sometimes school can take our children and we you know, we can see a lot of experience as last uh, we had a Bible camp uh, years ago, and uh, the families, Christian family from different places, they bring their children, and in the Bible camp we start like teaching them and asking them who is the last prophet, and the most of them they say this is the last prophet is Muhammad. I mean, which is. Uh, it's like you need to start from them with the beginning. It is hard because sometimes the uh, the family, the, I mean the parents, Christian parents, just busy sometimes in work, sometimes in uh, maybe then they give much attention for their children, but in school they are teaching them uh, other things, which is of teachings against their faith. But after when children they grow up. The parents, when they start looking after their children, and then they see them that totally they are is yeah. I think we need to be aware about our children in school. Mm-hmm. Like we thank God, uh, we uh, is like we help them from the beginning. Just like study Bible, we use like uh, Bibles with uh, with cartoons. Yes, I want to say to the parents, be very careful because there is other teachers which is teach the opposite of what they believe. <laughs> we need to be careful about our children. Sometimes we can be busy and maybe there is now an opportunity and also because some parents may can go to the meeting that they leave their children. They say, okay, because this is a culture, only the father they go to the to do this before you mean before they become a Christian. Only the fathers they go to like to the mosque when they meet Jesus is like same thing. That is is not mm-hmm. his, his person okay. is the family is responsible about his life. Yeah, but we need to give them more time like when they are yeah, still young. Uh huh. It sounds too from a couple of things you've said not just in this recording, but other conversations I've had with you all, that their character is very important. You're you're trying to not just teach them the truths of Scripture about facts about the Bible, but you're trying to make sure that they have excellent character, that they're honest, that they're respectful and kind, so that they are they don't they're a good example of christianity if anyone finds out that they're a christian yes that they don't bring you know problems on themselves by bad behavior yeah <laughs> yes. yeah yes yeah. yes all the time be careful be, be careful yeah. yeah oh 
Well, that's a big burden on a child, I think. But yes. um, yeah. It, yeah. yeah, even sometimes uh, when we have guests, they, they came and secretly and uh, whispered to my ear, say, uh, "Is this man a Christian? Are he a uh, yeah Christian? Yeah, because that the person is a Christian. Yeah, or, because they need to ask if they can talk." Uh, or freely not, or really just to be careful. In our yeah. home, not yeah, outside, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, that's kind of poignant. That's really sad that they can't be more comfortable. Yeah, but when they heard like the 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 person is Christian, he they are so happy and she's freedom to talk. To yeah, talk and they share with them their books and everything. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, thank you very much for your time and. Um, I appreciate your your faith and your your dedication to your country and your culture and trying to be a good influence wherever you are and oh, through your children. You. You're doing a great job with your kids, and uh, I happen to know that. <laughs> well, thank yeah. you for having us and giving us this time to yeah. share. Yeah, and Even our English about. is a little bit... <laughs> No, you're doing great. I, I wish I could speak Arabic half as well as you speak English. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and uh, we'll we'll send you on your way. Uh, thank you so much. Give your kids a hug. Bye bye. We're talking now with Shelley Alanis, and she is associate director of women's ministry for Ananias House, which is in Houston, ba based in Houston, and uh, she is the project lead on a wonderful book, and uh, it's called Through the Eyes of a Child. And we will focus somewhat on that in the second part of our interview. I want to talk with her about uh, the experience of parenting in a persecuting country because she's had direct and organizational contact with hundreds of people in a myriad of countries Tell us a little more about the work of Ananias House, Shelley. Yes. Well, uh, Leah, thank you for, for having, you know, uh, giving us an opportunity to share the ministry and the vision of what we're doing. Uh, what, what we do in Ananias House is we, we like to call ourselves the bridge. So we bridge this gap between believers in the West, so this body of Christ in the West, and the needs that are very present in the East. And so um, we, and because our primary mission is to equip the local church in in addressing those needs um, what we do is we work through the church and they come to us with with what you know with what the needs are with what the the, um, the issues that may be coming up and and we work to create that bridge and so uh, because of that fact it's very diverse you know we have our arms in a lot of different things we do different trainings for for pastors and leaders, for women, we we open schools for you know for kids uh, so that they have a place to get an education and um, and and it's a Christian education in different regions. And we uh, we do Bible printing, we do evangelism and uh, relief work. So it's it's varied as far as our our output our output, but essentially that's what we we're, we're that bridge between the East and the West. Okay. Well, um, your founder is from that uh, area of the world, North Africa, Middle East. Tell us a little bit more about him. Yes. And, you know, I kind of I feel like this is something that's unique to our ministry because I know there are a lot of um, ministries and, and nonprofits that focus on working in the 1040 window. Um, what's unique is that John Samara is from that area. He grew up in Syria. And so not only does he intimately understand the culture, uh, the dynamics of the culture, you know, what what the challenges are that they face. He he intimately understands the honor shame culture, um, having grown up in that. But he also has connections within the ministry. And so um, his father is still there, you know, and so, so so to be able to tap into the different churches throughout the regions, you know, we're, we're, uh, we were in 10 countries last year. Now it's 12 to 14. It's just expanding, but um, it's, I think it's such a value that we have someone who, who is able to connect with all of these different places and we can hear from the people on the ground, what the needs are. Um, and it's a direct connection. And that's, that's a huge value add. Yeah. 
Well, you mentioned the honor-shame culture. Could you tell my audience a little more about that? Yes. You know, one of the things that John um, said to me once, he said, a lot of times, you know, believers here in the West, we can we can see these um, these videos or hear these stories about the persecuted church, and we get um, you know we get moved by the fact that these people are losing their life for the sake of the gospel. You know, um, literally that when they when they convert to Christianity, that could mean death for them. And the way John put it is, he said, you know. What you have to understand is that giving like losing our life for the gospel, that's 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 no problem. He says we're willing to do that. He said the great persecution of the church in the East is not that that they would lose their life. The great persecution of the church is the honor shame culture, because it is so hard to escape from that mindset of the honor shame culture. And the more that I've, uh, you know, worked in ministry in that region and begun to understand it, I see what he means by that comment because the honor shame culture itself, you know, there's there's such a um, there's such a community minded definition of what is acceptable and what is unacceptable, and when something is considered or deemed unacceptable by the community, then then nobody's going to share that, right? So, so for example, if I'm a believer and I'm struggling with a certain sin, I'm not going to share that sin with anybody. I don't want to share that with you. I don't want to share that with you um, and tell you I'm struggling because that brings shame on me and my entire family. You know, not only am I um, defined culturally, uh, but it's a community that defines you and it defines your entire family. So, um, so I'm more inclined to to keep that to myself. And and you can imagine what that does relationally with, you know, individuals ability to form those deep relational connections. And let me let you into my to my world or just bring this sin to you or bring this struggle to you. So it has the relational, um, you know, obstacles that that creates. And uh, not only that, but the way that individuals operate within that is it's such a defining uh, it's such a defining component for choices that they make. Um, you know, if you look at even, uh, you know, young girls, there, there's a, a real issue with sexual abuse within um, a lot of families in the, the Islamic culture because the girl, um, her, you know, she doesn't necessarily have the rights uh, that, that, the, that the men have. And so if a family member chooses to, um, you know, take advantage of that and, and, um, you know, either, either molestations, rape, whatever that is, the girl has no right to say anything. And she wouldn't even choose to say something. She wouldn't even be likely to share that with others because that would bring shame on her. Um, and let me, so, uh, let me ask you about, uh, what if in a Muslim family in this geographic region where you all work, they have a, a conversion? Um, among them, if someone becomes mm -hmm. a Christian, how is um, how is the how how is the honor shame culture uh, impacting the phenomenon of a Muslim person becoming a Christian in the Middle mm -hmm. East or North Africa? Yeah, that's 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 huge too because uh, you know in in the Islamic mindset, Christians are infidels, and so. That is, you know, to choose to step away from from Islam and then to become a Christian is brings great shame on the family, uh, because in their mind you, you're choosing an infidel religion, and um, and so because of that shame, most often when families choose that, they are ostracized from the family, so um, they are no longer considered part of the family. Um, now, best case scenario is that they will they will disconnect, uh, cut ties with them. But uh, for a lot of them, the persecution is even greater, depending on the region that they're in, because uh, they even feel they have the right to to in that person's life. And so oftentimes it's close family members that are the greatest threat to an individual when they convert, because, you know, we've had, we've had young people convert and they're, they're, they're in hiding from their parents, you know, they're in their twenties, but they're hiding from their, their father or their mother because they're, they're still Islamic and they know if they find them that they'll kill them. And so uh, that's certainly uh, a danger for them in that conversion. Well, let's talk specifically since this, that's what this episode is about. 
about parenting and the dilemmas and difficulties that parents in a persecuting country in Middle East, North Africa face. Yeah. You know, I I feel, Leah, that's that's so layered because um, depending on where you're at geographically, that might look a bit different. Um, When we're talking about some of these countries where they have been enduring significant trauma, you know, whether it's war, whether it's, um, you know, the economic collapse and, and what they're facing, uh, whether it's a huge um, uh, ISIS or, or Taliban presence that's that's bringing, you know, that level of persecution. You know, the, the problem is that when you're parenting in that environment, uh, on the one hand, you've got you've got children who who, you know, we had some of our families from Syria say their children you know, never went outside to play. That wasn't even an option because of, you know, the, the danger of bombing or ISIS. And and so uh, because of that, the, their childhood is so um, contained. And and for those parents also who are living in regions where there is some type of uh, either an economic challenge uh, or some type of persecution, what they also face is that those parents are often in survival mode. And when they're in survival mode, they are just focused on how do I, you know, how do I keep my child alive or how do I get their next meal? And so when they're in survival mode, that just the care, the the emotional and mental developmental care of the child, a lot of times is not even a part of the equation. And so one of the things that we've worked here is we're developing um, a part of our program is to address that, to go in and just teach the parents, hey, this is what happens when you get on the floor and you play with your child at at, at the toddler stage. This is what's happening in their brain development and their emotional development, um, just so they understand that it's not difficult, but it has significant impact. And this is how you, you know, you would parent a child who's, a, you know, a elementary age, or this is junior high, or this is high school, but just help give them the tools to be able to address those things, because when they're in survival mode, that just doesn't happen. Um mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine a lot of the parents that you work with who who are coming out, they've escaped a traumatic environment. They're emotionally shut down. They're um like you said in survival mode and don't have that much to give mm-hmm. to uh, these children who are also no doubt traumatized and even more confused than the parents. Yes, you make a great wow. point with that. And so, you know, one one of our big projects that we have at NNI's House is a it's a counseling program, and we we specifically do narrative exposure therapy to address complex PTSD because that is so often what those who are in trauma situations they're not the trauma is not ending. You know, it's not going away, and so you have to have a unique a way to address that complex PTSD that they're experiencing because when you address that that equips them to be able to relationally connect with others, relationally connect and parent, and relationally connect with God as well. So, Let me ask you about the dads. Obviously, these are are fairly patriarchal societies, most of them. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the African societies, even Sahara, we are more matriarchal, but most of, uh, of certainly the Middle Eastern families probably the the dad has the important place of authority and and protection obligations and providing that protection and providing is certainly hindered when um he's discriminated against he's he can't get a good job due to his religious identity or activities mm-hmm. have you found that it's hard on the fathers um mm-hmm. do the kids especially teenagers question or or lose respect for the father who can't protect them or can't provide for them oh gosh that's a that's a really good question um i feel what what i have observed and i know you know a father who who experienced that that conversion in the culture could speak to this um, far more, uh, far far better than I could. But I, I feel that it's it's another layer for a man to experience in the midst of that as they shift over. So you you already have the the shame of you know if I'm leaving the Islamic uh, religion and I'm and I'm moving to Christianity, you have the shame of that 
um, as, as far as how it's viewed culturally. But now there's a whole new identity that they are learning about as a Christian man versus an Islamic man, right? Um, an Islamic man is has one uh, way of, of operating, um, of identifying how he is with his family and um, how the society sees him and the rights that he has. A Christian man, you know, Christianity, we're called to be humble, right? We're called to serve. And these are not things that are gonna come naturally in that culture. So I've witnessed men who are who are Christian men, pastors, and they it's it's actually really beautiful to see how much they are countercultural. Um, and I believe that because at least the ones I've witnessed, you know, they do have children and the families who've come along with them in that um, they're able to to teach their children, teach their boys a different way of being that is very countercultural. Uh, I do believe, though, it is difficult. Uh, it's a difficult path for them, certainly, because as far as the community sees them uh, and as far as the culture sees them, there is uh, in their mind the shame and the weakness that now comes from serving. You know, to see a man serve a woman, that in their mind culturally is a weakness, whereas we know as believers that's a huge strength, right? And that's a that's a something mm -hmm. to be um to be commended, but but they're trying to live counterculturally, and we talk about that here in America, but that's a whole nother level of of doing that there for sure. That is such a, a powerful answer. I had it didn't go where I thought it would go, but it was it's important. Um, is it hard on children's faith um, to go through persecution? Do the parents talk about how? How do I convince my kids that God is still good or that he hasn't abandoned us just because mm -hmm. dad has been thrown in prison or that we're penniless? Mm -hmm. You know, that what I have observed in the culture, in, in the, the cultures who face a lot of persecution and a lot of challenges, whether it's environmentally, economically, because, in, and I, I had a seminary professor tell me one time that persecution is the seed of the church growing. It, it truly does um, cause this, this um, gosh, this eruption of, of, of the church growing. And so it's hard for us to grasp that here in America. But what you find there is that there is not an expectation that everything's going to be great circumstantially. We kind of have that expectation here. So it's harder for us here when when things aren't circumstantially going well for us to then question that. But there's not an expectation of that. They understand that, um, you know, far more than than I experience here in America, they understand that that there is going to be difficulty. So it's not a matter of, gosh, God, are you real because I'm struggling? What I found that in the midst of the struggles, they're not praying I mean, it's not, and, and again, it's not that they don't want things to go well, but their mind doesn't go to the place of, let me pray that this whole situation would all go away and everything would be great. What they pray is that God work in me through this. What are you doing in me? Strengthen me from within, you know, with your Holy Spirit. So it's such a persevering faith that is, is very inspirational, I believe, um, should be very inspirational to us here because they understand that that there things will be difficult you know you will go through difficult things and so faith um the faith is not it's 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 more unshakable than than you might see here when those circumstances are are turned upside down i've had a few people say oh we we need to ex experience persecution in this country maybe our families would be stronger and our churches would be stronger but I say, uh, no, you <laughs> don't want that. You don't want that. You don't want I, that. Yeah. Um, it is true that hard hard times can unify people. It can also splinter people. There are so many moral dilemmas that. Sure. Um, di and, and different families might handle them differently. If one family member gets imprisoned and says you can be freed if you renounce Christ they might do that mm -hmm. for their family and then be rejected by the church another might stand firm and the uh, the church has to support them because there's no other way to live 
sustain mm-hmm. themselves. Um, and then the church might look at the other family and go, you know, mm-hmm. well, <laughs> the, how, how you view those two kinds of people is, you know, there's a, a spectrum of reactions to that kind of thing. And um, another thing I find in, in these churches is there isn't much for the children to do. And and sometimes the families don't even dare tell their kids that they have converted. They don't tell their children. Mm-hmm. They don't teach their children about Christ be, or take them to church because they're afraid that mm-hmm. word will get out and that people will be harmed by a little child's, you know, Yes. spouting something off to somebody. Sure, absolutely. There 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 you have and in certain regions it's it's a life or death situation, so they are very careful, you know, and we've had Christian uh women who will continue to wear the hijab because they don't want to be outwardly exposed to to that um and so yeah, to your point Leah, it's 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 a tricky situation for uh for each person and depending on the region can be um can be much more difficult. You might get a uh, woman who has converted and her husband is not. And even though Islam doesn't require this, there are cultures uh, within Islam that believe in um, female circumcision, what we call female genital mutilation. And the woman has the dilemma of, do I stay with my husband, as it seems the church and the Bible teach? But also, mm-hmm. do I protect my daughters, as the Bible also would teach? And, you know, they're, they're difficult ethical mm-hmm. dilemmas that parents face that we've really never dreamed of here. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and I want to talk with you, of course, about this book that you have worked so hard on. And, um, I, well, I'm, I can take a picture Um, tell us about the book how it was made Mm -hmm. uh, what was involved and um, we'll we'll talk about some specific vignettes in it sure yes so the book the the, it it started because John you know growing up there he really uh, understood the different dynamic that children face uh, in the Middle East and North Africa and so what he wanted to do was tell their stories essentially you know um you know because we're we're are we're working to be that bridge between the east and the west we wanted to bring those stories here and so what we did is we interviewed we interviewed families we interviewed um uh, pastors and we interviewed uh, individuals who work within the school systems there and and really just getting a sense of what is a, a a common thing that children might face. And so that's one of the things we're telling nine stories in the, in the book. And these stories are not like exceptions. Like this is an exception of a story. These are, these are common threads that are seen throughout the culture and what children may face. And some of the children that are featured in the book are young. Some of them are older, uh, you know, 17, 18, I think is our oldest one. And it was, difficult to to do the research. It was difficult to write the book as well because, um, you know, the more we became involved, we, we understood that these are real children that are being impacted by by these stories and real situations. Uh, and so that that was the idea is just to to give individuals a glimpse into their lives. Can you share a couple of the uh, characters? I, I know you've change names and don't reveal certain details, right. but um, share a couple with our audience to what their appetite. Oh, goodness. Yes. Okay. Um, so you're going to have to, you know what, let me, let me grab my copy. Okay. So I want to have it in front of me as well, because there's a couple that I really fell in love with. Okay. So, and I'll tell you what we worked to do in all the stories was to, because they're hard to read. Some of them are really hard to read. And we wanted to show what God did in the midst of the situation. Either God worked through the church or God worked through the school, the Christian schools that we have. But 
but just to see, you know, God's footprint in, in, in how he moved in that child's life, despite the difficulties. And I think that for us is hard to imagine children experiencing and going through this. And when you talked a minute ago about people's faith being shaken, that's one of the things, right? Why do terrible things happen to, to children of all people? And so um, when we can take a step back and really see God's hand in it and how he's moving, it's a powerful thing. It's a very powerful thing. Um, you know, one of the stories that was without a doubt, one of the hardest for us to write, um, is, is the story of, um, and I have his actual name in my mind. So let me see what we called him in the book. <laughs> Cause I want to, I don't want to call him, uh, I want to say it was Zaid, but let me see. I think it's Zaid. Yeah. Zaid in the book. And his story was a particularly difficult one for, for us. Now, Zaid is, um, his age is right around 14, 15. And this is a unique age within the Syrian refugee camps. So these are refugees um, who are, you know, they've come over, they're in a different country now. And the country that they're in does not, they're not allowed to be in public school. Okay, they can they can they have access to education at, a, at, a, at an elementary level. Once they get into middle school, junior high, high school age, there's no more access. They have no access to education. So what happens in these in these refugee camps is the young men, that is a prime age for ISIS to be able to recruit those boys. And what they do is they take them, they take them over into Syria. And now they're they're never seen again. They're recruited into ISIS. Um, a lot of the young girls, what they face is that they are married off. Now, these are refugee camps. It's hard to feed everyone. You know, their their um, their resources are extremely limited. So rather than trying to feed all these children, as soon as the, the young girl gets to a certain age, they'll marry her off to a man. And so at 14, these young girls are being married to grown men. So this is kind of a, what they face within the Syrian refugee camps. And so this particular young man um, was, we have a school in this area. And the principal of our school visited the camps and visited his family. And even though the camps are pr predominantly Muslim, um, and he told them we have a Christian school, they agreed to let this, their son come to the school. And so he was excited. He was going to start on, you know, on a Monday. And he, when Monday came, he didn't show up for school. And so our principal ended up visiting the the family uh by wednesday of that week i believe later in the week just to find out like you know where is zaid you know we expected him on monday and the father let him know that uh that a group had come and the group was isis and and so they had come and offered his son a job in in syria and said that they would send you know send money to the family so they let his their son go and so that was heartbreaking for us to hear that one because we we knew that that um, you know, unless God chose, we we likely wouldn't see him again. Um, but that is that is a reality that many fam families are facing because of the circumstances. Um, yeah, and uh, and a full circle story I want to tell you, Leah, because this is just a powerful one in the book. Is you, you'll you'll read the story of Amir, and um, whose name is also changed. But Amir, uh, as a young boy, um, lived in in Iraq actually, and so he was there. Uh, as a young boy, had a had a Catholic mother and an Islamic father, which is not okay. It's taboo, um, and it was not accepted. So he was actually kidnapped at about 10, 10 years of age and kept for three months uh, because of this. And so um, he was able to escape. Uh, it actually was the U.S. military that came in and helped him escape, um, and his, his mother was reunited with him, and, and they moved to Syria uh, where they encountered um, – a school uh, that was run by someone in the Samara family, John's John's parents. And so he encountered that school and learned what it was like, to, uh, this Christian education, uh, became a really a part of that mindset. And so when he moved back to Lebanon, uh, he was sharing with uh, John's brother, Sila, that he really just wanted to, uh, you know, felt for these children, these Syrian refugee children who didn't have education, didn't have access to it. And so he proposed uh, that we open a school, was able to to get that ball rolling. And so now we have a school there in in um, Lebanon and he's the principal of that school. So his story mm -hmm. just came full circle around. Uh, and mm -hmm. so he's one of the ones that gets to minister to those children, which is awesome. Oh, that's great. Well, um, 
As we conclude, I just want to make sure that my audience can find you and uh, get the book. How do they get in contact? Yes, so they can. Uh, our website is www.ananiashouse.org, O-R-G. So you can go to our website and order the book right there online. Um, and it's 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 not a huge book. It's a short read, but it's it's a great uh, and we call it a children's book. It's not for children. It's stories of children. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's powerful. And uh, it's there are some painful chapters, but also there's there's beauty in it. And Shelly, thank you for working on this and all that you do for people who are persecuted in the Middle East and North Africa. Yes. And um, God bless. Oh, thank you so much, Leah. Thank you. Subscribe and review Conversation Balloons on your favorite podcast platform. Find me at leahfarish.com and on Instagram at L-E-A-H-F-A-R-I-S-H. -E